Good evening. This is where I used to stand all the time on Sunday nights. Always. That was a long time ago. I don't know when it got so formal uh, that I moved upstairs. Um, but this feels more comfortable. Um, going to do something I probably have never done before to start a lesson, and that is to tell you to shut your Bibles, uh, because we're going to start with a pop quiz, and you don't get to look up any answers. So close book, pop quiz, and you have to, uh, you have to answer some questions, or a question, really. Um, oh, I'm good with blurting. I'm, I'm a laid-back kind of teacher guy. Um, so the question is, what do you know about Melchizedek? Okay, so Mel, first thing is, can I spell it in front of you while you're all, C-H, Melchizedek, okay, and the second thing is, can you read my writing? Nope, nope. <laughs> you can't read anyway, all right, uh, Melchizedek, uh, one thing we know, one thing we know, he was a priest, I was expecting that one, good, okay, he was a priest, what else do we know? Uh, I heard the word Abraham. Okay, what about Abraham? He knew Abraham. Okay, so to uh, knew Abraham. Can I spell Abraham? A B. This does. This board does not have spell check. Uh, Abraham. Okay, knew Abraham. Some king of Salem. Ooh. Okay. All right. King of Salem, S-A-L-E-M, -E I got that one, all right, ooh, okay, he's, he gets very few mentions in the Bible, how about that, okay, um, because uh, few, uh, few mentions, and we'll talk, we'll talk some about that fact tonight. Okay, and by the way, I should have told you this. If you got enough of them right to begin with, I wouldn't need to preach and we'd be done. No, that's not the way this works. Okay. Um, ooh, okay, so there's, a, there's, there's something going on with, um, with Jesus. Uh, how, to, how to write that in few words? Like? Okay, so there we go. So like Jesus, you kind of understand what I'm saying there. So there's a comparison made between Melchizedek and Jesus, okay? Okay, anything else we want to add to that list? Ooh, oh man, I may not need to preach. Okay, no beginning, no end. No, it gets harder to write be, uh, beginning slash end. The lower I go, the harder it is to write down there. Well, I'm saving that side. That's the post-test at the end. We've got to decide what we, what we learn. Uh, this, is, this is a thing you do at the beginning of a unit in school to find out what your kids know about what you're already going to, or what they already know about what you're going to teach them. And then after you teach them, you're supposed to give them the same test and see if they know more. That's, it's scary when you do that because sometimes they don't know more. Sometimes they know less at the end. Uh, than they knew when they started. Um, so pre-tests and post-tests are scary sometimes. Uh, all right. Anything else we want to add to that list? Where in the Bible, few mentions of the Bible, where would we turn to in the Bible to, to learn about uh, Melchizedek? Genesis. Genesis. Anybody got a chapter? I, I know because I looked it up earlier, but I don't know if I would have come up with the, the exact chapter or not. Okay, so we're going to... We're going to spend a little time in Genesis 14, okay? Ooh, Hebrews, of course, there's Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapters 5 through 7, okay? And then my wife had a good, good response. Anybody know the psalm? Which one? You got 150 chances. One out of 150 chances if you guess. Okay, it's Psalm 110. Uh, Psalm 110 mentions about, and that's it. 
10 mentions in the Bible, one in Genesis, one in Psalms, and eight times in, in Hebrews, uh, the name Melchizedek appears. And considering the story that is related in Genesis, it's remarkable that his name only shows up one time in that whole story, but once he's identified, it's like he and him. You know, it's not, it's not he doesn't, it doesn't use his name over and over. So he is mentioned in Genesis 14, and then in, in, uh, in Psalm 110, and we'll spend some time there. Uh, but first, we're going to start in Hebrews. Um, what, well, I, put, I suppose, I maybe, I'll, maybe at some point I'll start preaching and stop asking questions. Um, but what, uh, does anybody remember the context of the, why the Hebrew writer brings up Melchizedek? Or what happens within the context of the Hebrew writer bringing up Melchizedek? That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than a whole bunch of things in, in, uh, in the book of Hebrews. So he's better than Abraham. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priestly system. He's better than the high priest. He, he presides over better promises, over a better covenant. He has, uh, there's a better uh, tabernacle uh, under the new system than the old system uh, that Jesus has entered into. All of those things are presented in Hebrews. And, and so Jesus is better. Okay, according to the order. That's what the Hebrew writer wants to talk about. Jesus as a priest of the order of Melchizedek. But, but what, is, what happens early on when the, when the Hebrew writer mentions Melchizedek? Well, we're going to get there. So, at the end, towards the end of chapter 5, uh, Chapter 5, verse um, 8. Let's start in verse 8. Although he was a son, that is, Jesus was a son, he, was, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hard stop right there. The Hebrew writer has introduced a name, has introduced a concept, a thought, that Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and he, he just instantly stops there because he, he knows that he's gone too deep too fast, and it's not going to be, he's not going to be able to make the point he wants to make. Um, who is he talking to in Hebrews? I'm still asking questions. It's okay. You can talk. Who is he talking to? Who is the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews who are in danger of, Jewish Christians who are in danger of going back to Judaism. So he's, so, so he's writing to a group of people who have a special affinity for the law, who have a special love for the law, a special relationship with the law, and they have a desire to go back to what feels comfortable, to back, back to what they've known all of their lives, back to Back home, basically, is the way they're looking at it. They're, they're very comfortable with the law because that's what they've always known. And then they got called out of that system, out of that way of life, and into a new system that feels different, and it feels kind of scary, and it feels not the same, and maybe we don't like it as much as we liked our old way of life, so maybe we should go back to our old way of life because we were very comfortable there. And so the Hebrew writer, those, all those things about Jesus is better is spending all of this time telling them he, what you have now, what you've accepted in Christ is better than what you want to go back to. And so he's, he introduces this idea of Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, but, but there's a problem with that. Number one, they're not particularly well-grounded in Christianity yet. They're not particularly well-grounded as, as followers of Christ and so they don't maybe really understand the connection of Christ as priest. They maybe don't really understand the connection as Christ as king. They maybe don't really don't understand all of the things that he's made the points about so far. And how many times does Melchizedek get, in, get mentioned in the scriptures that they revere? How many mentions? Two. There's two mentions of Melchizedek by name in, in the, the Law of Moses and in Psalms. And so we're going to make this, this gigantic, huge theological point about who Christ is based on two mentions 
And, and that's kind of one of the points. The fact that he doesn't get many mentions kind of, kind of feeds the whole story, kind of, kind of establishes some things about Melchizedek that we can draw some comparisons with. But you have to, you, you have to be able to take that leap. You have to be able to make that, uh, take that step and see the comparisons and understand the validity of the comparisons. And so the Hebrew writer stops right here with that first mention of Melchizedek and then says, verse 11, 511, concerning him, that is Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who takes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infinite infant, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now, if you're a sensitive person reading that and you know it's directed to you, that could that could be that could sound kind of harsh. Like I'd like to I'd like to talk about some deep theological things with you, but you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't understand it. Um, and here, you know, and so, so he's telling him that, and then, um, solid food is for the mature. You're not mature enough to understand the point I'm going to try to make about Melchizedek. You're not well grounded enough in truth to be able to discern good and evil. Do we have evidence that the people who were the recipients of this letter were not able to discern good and evil? The fact that they were willing to give up Christ to go back to a law that was insufficient is, I mean, it's evil. It's not, it's not okay. And so as much as we'd like to try to candy coat that or sugar coat that and say, well, they were just more comfortable with it, it's, it's evil to forsake Christ to go back to something that is inferior. And so they have had their senses dulled by a misunderstanding of God's truth to the point that they're willing to give up what is righteous to go back to what is inferior. And, and the Hebrew writer does not pull punches there, does not try to candy coat that. And so, um, so that's our introduction to Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, that it's a deep theological thing. It's not, it's not a simplistic teaching. It's not, uh, this, is why, this is why this would be a good Sunday night sermon topic and maybe not the best Sunday morning Sunday topic, right? So, because you guys are like, this is like the master's class. You guys are the ones that are committed to being here, and you guys are the ones that want to go deep into the theological understanding of the scriptures. So, that, that was a compliment. Um, so, we have the, the Hebrew writer wanting, wanting really to, to investigate a deep truth, but he feels like he has to go back and do some foundational teaching first. And that's what chapter 6 is. So, chapter 6 goes into some foundational teaching, and we're not going to cover all of that because it's already 6 o'clock. Um, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to a maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We've already covered that. We, we're not going to lay that foundation again. This is the reason you became a Christian in the first place. The reason you left behind what you left behind in the first place was because of your understanding of sin and the need to forgive, need for forgiveness and the fact that the law can't do that. The law cannot forgive you. And so why are you in danger of leaving what can forgive you or leaving forgiveness to go back to a law that can't forgive you? So he says, you know, we're not going to rehash all of the same stuff that we've already been through but he does want to lay some groundwork um, for who Melchizedek, at, Melchizedek is and why he matters. Um, and so, verse 9, we are convinced of better things for you. There are better things for you than what you are trying to see for yourself. And that is to leave the good things about Christ and go back into Judaism. That's not good. These things accompany salvation even though we're speaking in this way, even though he's speaking harshly to them, even though he's telling them they're making a mistake and he's not pulling any punches with them, he wants them to know it is, it is, uh, it is an important subject. Um, so, going on down, verse 13, for when God made the promise to Abraham, now here we get back into the story of Melchizedek, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater than, he, than himself, he swore by himself. So God makes this oath with Abraham, the receiver of the covenant, the one who has 
the, the one who any Jewish person would revere as the, the pinnacle of our faith. He is the one, right? He's the example of faith. He's the one who sacrificed Isaac. He's the one that, uh, that first met God um, and, and, and all of these things. So Abraham is so important to their faith, and, and the Hebrew writer is going to honor that by the things that he says here. And God makes this promise to Abraham by two immutable things. First of all, when God promises, you know, that's a, God can't lie. And so just the fact that God has promised is is an immutable lie it cannot be broken but then he goes on to that he goes on from that and he swears by himself so god takes an oath which really isn't necessary because if god says it he's going to do it but just to establish his sincerity just to establish the fact that he's going to honor this promise that he's made he swears by himself he swears an oath saying that he will uh that he will honor what he has said so verse 14 i will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. That establishes Abraham's credentials. Abraham is worthy of the reverence that the Jewish people have given him because God has put him in that position. Um, and then, um, so then, the hope we ha- this hope we have is an anchor of the soul down, down on a few verses, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest according to, uh, high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Whoa, there's Melchizedek again. What does this have to do with anything? Why are we, all of a sudden, we've been talking about how great Abraham is. Why are we back on this subject of Abraham or back on the subject of Melchizedek? Well, it's because of the relationship between Abraham and Melchizedek. Now that we've honored Abraham, we've talked about how great he is, and now that we've reintroduced the topic of Melchizedek, Let's see how Jesus, being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, establishes him as being somebody greater than Abraham. Um, So, that gets us into chapter 7. Now we're ready for the, now we're ready for the deep theological truth. We've established that that we've honored Abraham, that that it's a, a good thing that God has done to establish this oath and this promise through Abraham. The covenant with Abraham was a good thing. Oh, and Abraham interacts with Melchizedek. And because of that interaction, we're going to show that Christ, being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, makes Christ greater than Abraham. That's, that's, those are some serious dots to connect. I mean, if we're going to do that, we got to know our stuff. Okay, so here's the way the Hebrew writer lays that out for us. Um, Verses 1, let's look at verses 1 through 3, first of all. For this Melchizedek... King of Salem, hey, that one's on our list. Good job. Uh, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God. So he was a priest, and specifically a priest of the Most High God. There are, there are priests in the Old Testament that we would not honor, right? There are priests of Baal and of Asherah and of other things in the Old Testament. And there are priests who do not fulfill their functions in a godly way that we would also not honor. Um, and so here we have Melchizedek being, uh, being built up as a priest of the Most High God, but not just a priest, a faithful priest of the Most High God, um, who met Abraham. We've got that on the list. He knew Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Remember the story in Genesis 14, Lot and his family and all of the stuff that they had, had been captured uh, by a, a roving band of, of tribal kings and Abraham gets a, a bunch of people together, all of his servants and, a, and an army of other kings from around, and they chase them down and they slaughter all those kings and rescue Lot and his family. And, and up, upon returning from that battle where they have rescued Lot and they have taken a lot of stuff captive because these kings had their own stuff aside from what they had captured from Lot, uh, they return by way of Salem and it's in Salem that Abraham meets Melchizedek, who is a priest of God, who is a king. And Abraham, it says uh, in, in verse 2, uh, Hebrews 7, verse 2, whom Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning nor end of day or days of uh, beginning of days nor end of life, 
but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So we've got several of those things on the list, but we could maybe flesh some of those things out, and our list could grow a little bit if we start adding some more bullet points there about who Melchizedek is. Um, so this interaction that he has with Abraham is an interaction where Abraham pays a tenth of the spoils of war. In fact, Abraham then, after paying that tenth of the spoils, does what with the rest of it? How much of it does Abraham keep? Nothing. Abraham doesn't keep anything. He, he pays a tenth of all the spoils to Melchizedek and then disperses all the rest of it out to the people who fought the battle. They get to keep the stuff, but Abraham does not keep any of it because it is God who blesses Abraham. Abraham doesn't go and get his own stuff, right? He doesn't get his stuff by conquering other people. He gets his stuff because God blesses him. And so, um, so Abraham shows himself to be tremendously um, loyal to God through this whole episode and, and a, a tremendously pious person by the things that he does. But it's this interaction with Melchizedek that the Hebrew writer is going to draw upon to establish Jesus as being better than Abraham himself. So, um, all of these little details that he is, um, he is the king of righteousness. How is that established? What is, what is that? Verse, verse, three, uh, verse 2, by the translation of what? By, by the translation of his name. I don't, I mean, I don't speak whatever language Melchizedek is, but that name means king of righteousness okay so the the fact that he is named melchizedek tells us that he was a king of righteousness and you know the importance of names in the old testament and so was melchizedek the name that his parents gave him at birth i know we don't know anything about his parents we're going to make that point later but was that his name all of his life probably not why was he given that name because of who he was because of, because of his character, because he had earned that name through the way that he reigned, through the way that he ruled, through the way that he cared for his people. And so we learn something about his character just by his name, that he was the king of righteousness. Um, and he was not only the king of righteousness, but he was the king of Salem. And what does the word Salem mean? Peace, okay? Um, it's, I mean, the traditional Jewish greeting of shalom is peace, and that, I mean, that's Salem. It's that's the way we, we would say that in, uh, in our language. And so Salem, shalom, peace, he is the king of peace. Well, what is Jesus? He is the prince of peace, and what do princes become? Upon their coronation, they become the kings, right? And so we have Jesus in Ephesians chapter 2 being the peace between the two, uh, bringing peace between the two groups, Jew and Gentile. Jesus, uh, Jesus is associated with peace as well. And so uh, here we have Melchizedek, who is a king of a city, uh, who is a priest of the Most High God, who is a king of righteousness, who is a king of peace, and he is being used to establish Jesus as being better than Abraham. So all of these things are laid out so that we learn something about Melchizedek and we take note of the details about Melchizedek, even though he only gets one mention in, he in Genesis chapter 14, but the Hebrew writer, through inspiration, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, draws out all of these details about Melchizedek and then a, a, um, makes use of those details to help us learn something about Jesus as well. So um, Melchizedek is all of these things that we have listed and more according to, um, according to Hebrews chapter 7. So verse 4 now, having established who Melchizedek is, let's, let's, learn how this, um, let's learn how this interaction between Abraham and Moses, or Abraham and Melchizedek, applies to who Jesus is. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. So this man was a great man, and it's based on the details that we've already been given, plus based on the interaction that Abraham has with him, we are established that Melchizedek was a great man. Those indeed of the sons of Levi who receive the priest's office have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. So the Levites, who are the priestly tribe, have been given the directive by God to collect a tithe from their brothers. Uh, all of the rest of the, the Israelites, they collect uh, a tenth. But they are descendants of Abraham. Who's greater, Abraham or his Levitical descendants? 
Who's the greatest in that list? Abraham's the greatest. In that list, I mean, there's no Levite, there's no priest, there is no Jewish person living at this time who would say, we're better than Abraham because we're the ones receiving tithes and Abraham was the one that paid the tithe. Nobody would say that. Abraham was the greatest. And so the Hebrew writer is going to take that and say, now wait a minute. You say Abraham was greater even though he's, he's the one paying the tithe. Well, who, who's the one that is the greater in that scenario? Melchizedek has to be the greater one because the greater doesn't, doesn't pay to the lesser. The lesser pays to the greater. And so the fact that Abraham pays him a tithe, pays him a percentage of the spoils of war, tells us that Abraham recognized that Melchizedek was greater than he was. Um, and so the Levites, the priestly tribe, the fact that they collect the tithe establishes them as being the greatest of the tribes. They're the ones that have the special priestly relationship with God that the other tribes don't have. And so that priestly tribe, um, in a sense, is greater even than their father Abraham. <clears throat> so then verse 6, <clears throat> another detail that is brought out. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had, made, who had received the promise or who had the promise. So Melchizedek received the tithe from Abraham. That establishes him as greater. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. If you go back and read the story in Genesis 14, Melchizedek offers Abraham a blessing. Well, Next verse, verse 7, without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So who's greater in that scenario with Abraham and Melchizedek? Melchizedek is greater because he's the one that receives the tithe and he's the one that gives the blessing. So already we've established that there is somebody who is greater than Abraham. And if you're a Jewish person the idea that anybody's greater than Abraham is a hard pill to swallow. That, that's hard medicine. But based on these two facts alone, somebody was greater than Abraham. And that somebody was Melchizedek. So now that we've established that somebody is better than Abraham, let's see how that applies to the situation they find themselves in. And, and we'll do that here in a minute. So in this case, verse 8, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. Whoa, wait a minute. Who lives on? Abraham? Not Abraham. Abraham's dead and gone. Who lives on? Melchizedek. That's, that's a tough one. This is a, this is a hard one to, to kind of wrap your minds around, but the idea that Melchizedek lives on, we have record of Abraham's death in the scriptures. Where do we have a record of Melchizedek's death? We, we don't know anything about it. And so we have no knowledge of his death. We have no reference to his death. We have no understanding of his death, anything about that. And so, so there's a sense in which his legacy his his history lives on and that is going to be applied to jesus here in just a minute so and so to speak verse 9 and so to speak though abraham through abraham even levi who received tithes paid tithes so even though levi is the tribe that of the priests and they receive tithes in a sense because they were still he says in the next verse in abraham's loins they had not yet been birthed through the lineage. Uh, they, through Abraham's paying of tithes, have paid tithes themselves. And so they are symbolically giving a tithe to Melchizedek. And, and we've already established the greater receives the tithes, the lesser pays the tithes. And so uh, the greater gives the blessing, the lesser receives the blessing. And so... All of these things lay that foundational work, lay that, give us this understanding of who Melchizedek was, that had we, did, did we not have, if we did not have Hebrews chapter 7, I sure wouldn't be the preacher that drew all those things out from the story of, uh, of Melchizedek in, Hebrew, in Genesis chapter 14 and said, hey, look at all these things that we can learn about Melchizedek. Uh, and then we can apply those things to Christ 
um, it, it took the inspiration of the Holy Spirit leading the Hebrew writer to all of these conclusions for him to be able to draw these things out. So, so what, who cares? Okay, great. Melchizedek was a good guy. Awesome. So what? Verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on it the basis of the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? How do we even get there? How do we get this idea that somebody else arose according to the order of Melchizedek? We, there's a scripture we haven't looked at yet. Which one haven't we looked at yet? Psalm 110. Look at Psalm 110 real quick. You talk about an obscure person in the scriptures. Melchizedek gets one mention in one story in Genesis, and he gets one mention in the book of Psalms, and the Hebrew writer has spent three chapters talking about the significance of this man in relation to proving that Jesus is better than Abraham, Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood. And so Psalm 110 um, is without question a messianic psalm. Um, we have, we have, I've got, I'm not texting, I promise. Okay, I've got a couple of scripture references that I, I had in another spot. So um, Psalm 110 Verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Does that sound familiar? Other than having read Psalm 110 before? Do we, have we heard that passage before? Well, yes. Luke 20. Uh, remember this, I, I'll do the best I can to turn, turn here quickly, but uh, not my regular Bible and the pages stick together. So um, Luke 20. Verse 43, uh, Jesus here has been talking to the scribes. They've been questioning him. Finally, in verse, uh, verse 39, some of the scribes answered after this long exchange with Jesus. They answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well, just because they didn't want to continue the conversation because they were tired of getting beat up by the things Jesus was saying. So they've given up trying to accuse Jesus of anything. Uh, because they've run out of accusations that Jesus can answer. So then, verse 41, Jesus says to them, now he's going to turn the tables on them and ask them some questions. He says, how is it that they say that Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, David calls him Lord, and how is he his son? Jesus applies this passage to himself and says the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that we're waiting for as a people to fulfill God's promise is a descendant of David, and yet David calls him Lord. How is that possible? And they can't answer. They don't, they don't dare answer that question. And so Jesus leaves it alone for the moment, but Jesus applies this passage to himself. It is a messianic psalm. Uh, Acts 2 um, in Acts chapter 2, we have the, the, the apostles receive the Holy Spirit. Peter is giving the very first gospel sermon, and he establishes, uh, he establishes through the use of several scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, and he ends the sermon. He, his, his, his invitation at the end of his sermon is this verse, Acts 2 verse 35, um, Verses 34 and 35, For it was it not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The final, the final point that Peter makes in his sermon to the Jews who killed Jesus that is to convince them that they killed the Son of God is to quote this passage and apply it to Jesus. And so Psalm 110, a messianic psalm, it's one that they had recognized would apply to the Messiah when the Messiah came. We could look at Hebrews 1.13 as well to establish the fact that the Hebrew writer even uses this passage before, um, Hebrew, before chapter 7 in reference to Christ. Hebrews 1.13 says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Jesus is better than who? He's better than the angels because God never said to the angels, sit at my right hand until I make you, the, your enemies a footstool. But he did say it to Jesus. He said it to his son. And so that makes Jesus better than an angel. Um, and so 
Psalm 110, just from the very first verse, it's a messianic psalm. And so the things that are in that psalm apply to the Messiah. And so keep reading in Psalm 110. The Lord, uh, verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of power, uh, your power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This guy that gets one mention in an obscure story about Abraham now is the subject to prove that the Christ will be a priest. The Messiah will be a priest, and a specific type of priest, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And so, so, here's, so here's where the Hebrew writer goes in chapter 7, after having established who Melchizedek was, and the fact that he was an important guy, he says... Um, he says there in verse 11 that we just read, there was another priest to, uh, to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not designated according to the order of Aaron. We have a problem with calling Christ a priest because he wasn't a descendant of Aaron. He wasn't by law able to claim the position of priest because he did not come from the right tribe. Christ came from the tribe of Judah. And so how can Christ fulfill this prophecy of being a priest unless he is a different type of priest than the Levitical priest? And that's what the Hebrew writer is making the case for. So, continuing on in chapter 7, for, uh, verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. So this law that is in effect that says only a Levite can be priest has to change if Christ is going to be a priest. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Melchizedek was not a priest because his father had been a priest before him. He was not a priest because he followed some lineage of priestly people. He was a priest because, he, because of his life, because of the life that he had lived. Why was his name the king of righteousness? Because he was a righteous man. Why was he designated a priest? Because he followed God and because he lived the life that God called him to live. And so he was a priest not based on lineage but based on righteousness and so Christ is able to lay claim to the priesthood, not because he's descended from Levi, but because he has lived a righteous life. And he's the only one that can do that, according to the law. No other person who's live, who lived after Moses, who lived post-law, can claim to be a priest based on an indestructible life. Only Christ can make that claim, in the same way that only Melchizedek can make that claim before Moses. And so... We have, we have there Christ being established as a priest like Melchizedek was, not based on lineage, but based on righteousness. Um, and so, verse 17, for it, we quote this verse that it, several times this verse gets quoted in the section. It says, For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there's the setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, and on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Inasmuch as it was with not, not without an oath, we talked about that already, that it was established with an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. God swore an oath saying that his Messiah, his son, would be a priest. God, God promised that through David, through an inspired writer, saying, my son, my Messiah, my Christ will be a priest. I have promised that. He never promised that to any descendant of Moses. He established the priesthood, and he, he made it run through a, uh, th through a birth order system, but he didn't pick out some guy a thousand years after the, the order, a, after Aaron had, had lived and say, I, I'm establishing this so that person can be a priest. 
But he did make that promise concerning his son, concerning the Messiah. And Jesus is serving as a priest based on an oath of God, based on a promise that God made, not because he was born through some special lineage. And so which one is better? Serving as a priest just because you got the right birth certificate? Or serving as a priest because you are serving on behalf of a God who promised that you would be a priest and you have earned that spot as priest based on an indestructible life? Which one's better? It's Jesus. Jesus is better. Jesus is the better priest. So he goes on, verse 23, um, the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were pre uh, prevented by death from continuing, but Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, and if you, if you go through your Hebrews chapter 7 and underline that word forever, it, man, that's a good word. It's, it's, you are a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And what did we already say about Melchizedek? His reign as priest continues, right? Because we don't know anything about his death. We don't have a record of the ending of his priesthood. And so Jesus serves as a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, not like the, the priests of the Levitical order, who every few years one would die and we got to have a new one. Jesus is a better priest because he continues forever. Verse 24, Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save those forever who draw near to God through him. Who do we want to, say, who do we want to have say that we are saved? The priest that dies the next day after he tells us we're saved or the priest that lives forever? Which one of those is better? The priest that lives forever telling us that we are saved is a better priest to hear say that than the one who dies the next day or the next year or the next month, right? And so Jesus is a better priest. For it was fitting, verse 26, uh, for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints men as a high priest who are weak but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever a son made perfect forever he is the high priest that we want to establish he is the high priest that we want to follow he is the one who serves in the as high priest in the model that melchizedek established for us not based on lineage based on righteousness, not based on lineage, based on an oath, based on a promise from God, not the priest that dies and has to be reappointed, but the high priest who lives forever and continues to serve in that role to this day. So deep theological truths brought out in the book of Hebrews based on a guy that gets one mention in Genesis, one mention in Psalms, and then, and then we have to take a pause from our from our elementary teaching to gird ourselves up and prepare ourselves to go deep into a teaching about somebody that we really don't know anything about. But the Hebrew writer is able to tell us about him and what is significant about it because of the inspiration that he has through the Holy Spirit. So, um, so post-test. Um, who I didn't, hadn't been looking at the clock. Sorry, guys. Um, um, post-test. What do we know about Melchizedek? What would we add to this list? High priest, not just a priest. He is a high priest. Of, of the God most high. Okay? He is righteous. Ooh, don't spell that word. Okay, my spelling of righteous was not very righteous. Uh, O-R-I-T-H-E-O-U-S. O-U-S, okay. Greater than Abraham. Greater than Abraham. He, not just that he knew Abraham, but he is greater than Abraham. Greater than Abe, okay. Okay, his righteousness, his indestructible life. I like that phrase, um, indestructible life. How long does he reign? 
forever. Okay, no beginning, no end. We got there kind of with that, but I love that word forever because it applies to Jesus in a special way. No genealogy, okay? Um, no genealogy. That you're going to genealogy. Uh, A-L-O-G-Y. Okay, that's a tricky one. Oh, yeah. If, if you want to go down some rabbit holes, you can do some reading on that, that, that where people, um, people try to, to make that into a, uh, into a lot of different things. There, you, if, you want to, if you want to try to identify who Melchizedek was before he was called Melchizedek, because probably his name was changed to the king of righteousness because of the life that he lived, you can find some pretty interesting rabbit holes to go down, and, and some of them are, I mean, some of them maybe are worthy of thinking about. Um, I didn't want to, I knew I was already going to be long here tonight, so that, I didn't go that way, but uh, some have proposed that he may have been Shem, the descendant of, of Noah, um, and, and the timing is right. He, it, it's possible that Shem, I mean, Shem was still alive during this time, uh, most likely, and then, uh, which would have been an interesting thing because Abraham is a descendant of Shem. So um, that, that's where we get the word Semitic is through, through the name Shem. So the Semitic peoples are descendants of Shem. Um, some have proposed that it's a, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ who was Melchizedek. I, I, that one doesn't do much for me, but some people have proposed that. Right. We don't, his genealogy, it's kind of the point. The fact that we don't have a genealogy is what helps us establish him as, a, as or helps us establish Christ as a priest like him. In fact, it's the very fact that he is an obscure character helps us establish these things. If we knew more about Melchizedek, we wouldn't be able to establish some of these things. I mean, if we knew his lineage, if we knew his death, if we knew, you know, what happened to him in other places, it may harm the analogy that we're making about Christ. And so it's based on the fact that we don't know much about him that the Hebrew writer, through inspiration, is able to tell us some things that fit that fit the, the oath that God makes in Psalms that tells us Christ will be like him. We, you know, I like, I, I like wondering about things and speculating and considering possibilities, but um, in, the end, in the end, the secret things belong to God. Deuteronomy 29 or something like that, I think that is. Um, the secret things belong to God. Okay, um, thank you for your participation, and, and I, it's, a, it's a fascinating character study in the Bible, um, one that, that uh, I, I enjoy talking about, obviously. So, um, Melchizedek, that's where it's at. Um, Jesus is our high priest. He has offered us forgiveness through his blood, blood that is more precious than any blood of any bull or goat or ram uh, that, that was available through the old law. And uh, it is a forgiveness that doesn't have to be re-earned year by year. Once he has forgiven us, those sins are gone and forgiven uh, because his blood is that precious. And Jesus didn't have to sacrifice for his own sin as the high priest did year by year. So um, that, that again makes him better than the, than the Levitical high priest. So if you have need tonight um, that we can help you with, uh, would you please come while we stand and sing?